Welcome back everyone to part two of our look at one misconception about each U.S. president. Seems like episode one was really well received. If you didn't see episode one of my reaction to this video from Mental Floss, the link is in the description. We covered the first 19 presidents in that episode. Today we'll cover the rest. Uh, without any further ado, let's go ahead and dive right into this. As always, the original content, the link is in the description if you want to check that out. Garfield the cat is named after Garfield the president. People think Garfield that's true. Jim Davis named the lethargic, carb-loading cartoon cat after his grandfather, James A. Garfield Davis. Was James A. Garfield Davis named after President James A. Garfield? Yeah, yeah. That's a pretty common thing, too. If you look at periods of history, uh, you'll see naming patterns. Uh, George Washington has always been a popular name for children. I have multiple ancestors who were named George Washington as their first and middle name. Uh, you'll see a lot of James K.P. for middle or for first and middle names uh, in the 1850s. Um, actually, another very popular one in the early 1860s was here in America to name a son Elmer Ellsworth as a first and middle name. Elmer Ellsworth was the first uh, American officer to die during the American Civil War. He was uh, a soldier who uh, they had crossed the river into Alexandria, Virginia to take down a Confederate flag from a hotel. And when Ellsworth had taken down that flag, he was coming down the steps and the hotel owner shot him dead. Uh, so he became kind of a martyr for the Union cause. So you see a lot of these popular naming patterns. So I guess technically James Garfield is the inspiration for Garfield the cat since he was the inspiration for the inspiration for the name. Interesting. Yeah, he was. So depending on how you interpret the transitive property of cartoon cat the names, the transitive property up, of God, maybe cartoon there is some cat truth names. to this misconception. Chester Arthur was secretly born in Ireland before. And I haven't heard that, but I've heard that he was secretly born in Canada. Interesting. I've never heard that. Ireland. And during Chester Arthur's presidency, his opponents spread a rumor that he'd actually been born outside the United States, which would, of course, make him ineligible to become the commander in chief. Not entirely true. It's been pretty well decided that as long as you're born an American citizen, you don't have to have been born in the United States. There have been, a, it's never happened that somebody has been elected president having not been born an American citizen. All right, this gets a little confusing. Under the Constitution, anybody who was a citizen at the time of the ratification of the Constitution was not covered by that rule. Because so, I've heard people argue that Alexander Hamilton could not have gotten elected president because he was born uh, in the Caribbean and not born in the United States. That didn't matter in his case because he was an American citizen at the time the Constitutional Convention uh, ratified the Constitution uh, or came up with the Constitution and it was later ratified and he was part of that convention. Uh, so that rule only applied to people who weren't born yet in 1787, I guess. Um, that said, there have been a number of people who have run for president. Ted Cruz is a perfect example. I'm trying to think of who else there has been. Uh, there have been a number of other people who have run for office. And that's why I never really understood the whole birther controversy with uh, Barack Obama, because he was born an American citizen regardless of where he was born. But I digress big time. One of the bigger sources for these conspiracies was Arthur Hinman, who originally claimed that Arthur had been born in Ireland. When that unfounded claim failed to gain traction, Arthur's opponents began saying he was born in Canada, there you go. not in Fairfield, Vermont, as he said. Arthur's official birthplace is in Fairfield, and the Canada story was likely concocted as a way to discredit him. So while nobody's ever come up with incontrovertible proof that he was born in Vermont or Canada, we can safely say the 21st president wasn't originally from the Emerald Isle. Grover Cleveland married his daughter. When Oscar Folsom died in a carriage accident, he married a girl that was young enough to be his daughter, but in 1875, his friend and former law partner Grover Cleveland took over managing his estate. Cleveland continued to be close with Folsom's daughter, Frances, and eventually married her during his first presidential term. Yeah, they were 27 years apart in age, and Cleveland seems to have started out as something of a father figure to Frances, leading okay. some to say the president had married his adopted daughter. For what it's worth though, Frances' mother was still alive and Cleveland was never formally her guardian or adoptive father. Weird, but not illegal, I guess. 
President Benjamin Harrison signed the Declaration of Independence. No, it was The Declaration Ancestor of Independence did. was signed, as you probably know, in 1776. Benjamin Harrison was born in 1833, which means he definitely didn't sign it. His great-grandfather, however, who was also named Benjamin yep. Harrison, did sign it. So that's so a cool story. The Harrisons are one of those longtime political families in the United States. Benjamin Harrison V signs the Declaration of Independence. His son, uh, William Henry Harrison, is the ninth president of the United States. William Henry Harrison's son, John Scott Harrison, was a uh, U.S. congressman. Uh, and then John Scott Harrison's son, Benjamin, becomes president. That's probably where people get confused. By the way, William Henry Harrison is the son of the declaration signing Benjamin Harrison and the grandfather of President Benjamin Harrison. That, this is too many Harrisons. 46 people have been president. Joe Biden may be commonly called 45. the 46th president, but only 45 people have actually had the job. Grover Cleveland's two non-consecutive terms throw a wrench into the presidential numbering machine. As of now, Cleveland is the only president to serve non-consecutive terms as president. Yeah, so Cleveland's considered the 22nd and 24th president, with Benjamin Harrison squeezed in there in between. William McKinley immediately succumbed to his gunshot. No, he wounds. lived like a week. On September 6th, 1901, at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York, Leon Chalgosh shot William McKinley once in the chest and once in the abdomen. The president was operated on almost immediately, and the doctors originally thought he'd recover. For the next five days or so, McKinley appeared to be doing pretty well. Then suddenly, his health completely deteriorated and he died early on September 14th. His cause of death was gangrene that had developed internally, perhaps from the unsanitary way his wounds were treated. Yeah, it's a sad reality that two of our four, first of all, we had three presidential assassinations in 36 years. Lincoln in 1865, Garfield 1881, McKinley in 1901. Uh, Garfield and McKinley with today's medicine would have easily survived their wounds. Uh, both died as a result of infection, as a result of secondary issues related to the bullet, but not directly from the bullet themselves. Garfield lived for months after he was shot. And you could make a really strong argument that had they done nothing and just left the bullet alone, he probably would have lived. But it was, they had, like created this gaping wound as they were like probing and trying to find the bullet and it had lodged up against his spine and uh, created kind of a protective sack around it. And he probably would have been fine. McKinley, same thing. Today with modern medicine, with antibiotics, with the treatment we have and with the sanitary conditions in which he would have been treated, would have survived his wounds. Theodore Roosevelt liked the nickname. No, no he did not. After Theodore Roosevelt refused to shoot a bear in 1902, a Brooklyn couple named Morris and Rose Mitchum decided to make stuffed bears in his honor. Supposedly they asked him if they could call them teddy bears and he agreed. But there are some problems with that story, not least because Roosevelt disliked the sober K, possibly because it's what his first wife, who died very young, called him. Yeah, he, boy, what a sad story, and what an amazing story Theodore Roosevelt has. His wife and his mother died within hours of each other. And, you know, just, you know, for all his tough persona, uh, and, and the guy had developed that tough persona because he was a sickly child, he overcame a lot of challenges in life. Um, he was not this big, strong, tough guy you think of. He was actually pretty weak and sickly for large parts of his life. But he overcame that with his attitude, with his perseverance, and became the tough guy that we think of. He, he Typically, I think he preferred to be called TR. Um, but, um, yeah, he in his diary that day that his wife and, and, uh, and mother died, he wrote, the light has gone out of my life. It, just such a sad day for him. No word on how we felt about Mr. Unusually Large Belly, which is what his African safari guides nicknamed him. William Howard Taft got stuck in a... Nope, never happened. Speaking of large bellies, at his largest, William Howard Taft tipped the scales at roughly 340 pounds, and he did love a good bath. As president-elect, he even had a custom 2,000-pound bathtub created for his use during a voyage to expect construction on the Panama Canal. But there isn't strong evidence that he ever got lodged in a White House tub. There is, however, a children's book inspired by the myth. It's called President Taft is Stuck in the Bath. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, and I think the, the ordering of the huge bathtub probably played into that a little bit, probably led people to say, well, the other one must have been too small. He probably got stuck in it. But yeah, it's one of those things that, you know, certain things that get repeated often enough, people start to believe them. Uh, and this is one of those things that to this day, a lot of people just believe is true. 
Woodrow Wilson was progressive on all fronts. Woodrow Wilson was considered a leader of the progressive movement. He spearheaded economic and labor reform and pushed for a bill granting railroad workers an eight-hour workday, among other liberal moves. But the word progressive implies that Wilson was a progressive person, and he really wasn't. Wilson supported segregation. He said he thought that it was the best way to reduce, quote, friction between black and white Americans. Yeah, and I've covered all of that in my videos about Woodrow Wilson. and. Some people will make the argument, well, but it was the time in which he lived. But no, even compared to other presidents around his time, he was racist. Uh, he actually implemented a lot of policies that previous presidents did not have. Um, I mean, at one point, they built a cage around a black person who refused to move to another part uh, of their office uh, so that he would be separated from the other people. Now, I'm not saying... Wilson ordered that to happen, but it was his policies that led that to happening. Yeah, he was definitely not a progressive guy when it came to race. He supported government agencies segregating workers during his presidency. A lot of black employees were simply dismissed, some yep. by Wilson himself. He also had positive things to say about the Ku Klux Klan. Even for his time, you'd be hard pressed yeah. to call Wilson anything close to progressive on issues related to race. Warren G. Harding had no children. No, he did. It's true that Warren G. Harding had no biological children with his wife Florence, but yes. he was an infamous philanderer. In a series of explicit letters with one of his paramours, Carrie Fulton Phillips, he sometimes referred to his penis as Jerry. This is, of course, the most erotic first name in the English-speaking world. A mistress of Harding's, Nan Britton, insisted that Harding was the father of her daughter, Elizabeth. He was. She even published a memoir in 1927 detailing their affair. Harding supporters did everything they could to discredit Britain. But and the problem, of course, with her publishing that in 1927 is by that point, Harding has died in office. Coolidge is president, uh, has taken over as president. And uh, so he's not there to defend himself, to refute it. And of course, in 1927, you don't have DNA, but we do now. And now we know she was indeed his daughter. Though Harding himself had died back in 1923. Then, in 2015, 10 years after Elizabeth's death, it was announced that DNA tests done on one of her sons and two of Harding's living relatives proved Britain's claim correct. Yep. Calvin Coolidge was boring. Calvin was quiet. Coolidge was a man of few words, which earned him the nickname Silent Cal. But he wasn't always a dull guy. He could even be a bit eccentric. While in office, Coolidge was fond of exercising on what was called an electric horse, which was basically a mechanical saddle that simulated horseback riding. He and his wife, Grace, were also enthusiastic pet owners. In addition to the traditional White House dogs, they had a bunch of house cats and a goose named Enoch, who had apparently been a famous acting goose before his time in the White House. Incredible. They also had canaries named Nip and Tuck, and a bobcat named Smokey Bob. One of the things I've found is that people who don't say a lot can come across as boring to people who are much more outgoing. But I've also found that people who don't say a lot, when they do say something, it tends to be really profound and really good. My, uh, my middle child, my son, uh, Caleb, who's 14, is by far the quietest member of our family. We are a very loud family, I guess you could say, uh, probably obnoxiously so. Uh, as are two of my three kids. But Caleb, when he does say something, it's usually either really smart or really funny or really interesting. Um, so yeah, b quiet does not equal boring. Bob was immediately put in the National Zoo, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you feel about the words White House and Bobcat mauling appearing in the same headline. The star of the Coolidge show was a raccoon that someone had gifted Coolidge in 1926, intending for him to eat it at Thanksgiving dinner. Yikes. But instead, Coolidge pardoned the creature, named it Rebecca, and let it run around the White House for the next two That's years. That's awesome. I mean, who wouldn't want to go to a party with Enoch, Rebecca, and Silent Cal? Everyone was happy to name the Hoover Dam after Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover had helped kickstart the construction of a Colorado River Dam when he was Secretary of Commerce in the 1920s, and the project began during his presidency. Hoover, Secretary of the Interior, attended the groundbreaking ceremony in 1930, proclaiming, I have the honor to name this dam after a great engineer who really started this greatest project of all time, the Hoover Dam. Considering Hoover's unpopularity during the Great Depression, mm. it's no surprise that people weren't too excited about adopting the name. 
this is the problem sometimes with naming something after someone who at the time is popular because that popularity can very quickly change. I've been to the Hoover Dam. It's a man, just a magnificent thing to see even to this day. Uh, just sometimes the wonders of engineering is just marvelous to behold. But yeah, by the time Hoover Dam opens, He's not such a popular guy anymore. Pliny just called it the Boulder Dam, as they'd already been doing. When Franklin D. Roosevelt took office in 1933, his Secretary of the Interior went with Boulder Dam. FDR didn't invite Hoover to the dedication ceremony two years later, and didn't even mention him in his speech. It wasn't until 1947 that Harry Truman made the Hoover Dam label permanent. Franklin D. Roosevelt couldn't drive. Oh, he drove. In 1921, 39-year-old FDR contracted polio. Possible bonus misconceptions, some sources actually think it could have been Guillain-Barre syndrome afflicting the president, not polio. Kind of interesting to think about, and, and people don't realize how far along in life FDR was when that happened. It was the 1920s, uh, he, 39 years old, and, and I think this is not too long before he actually runs as the vice presidential nominee on the Democratic ticket. Uh, so, yeah, he had a long life before he ever ended up in that wheelchair. I don't even think I have Band-Aids in my house right now, so I'll refrain from offering my medical opinion on the matter, but I thought I'd point out that there isn't universal agreement on his diagnosis. Either way, Roosevelt was paralyzed from the waist down. That meant he couldn't operate the foot pedals of a car, but that didn't stop him from driving, an activity he loved. He had a 1936 Ford Phaeton and a 1938 Ford convertible coupe customized with special control so he could drive by hand. Harry S. Truman never put a period after the S. The S of Harry S. Truman wasn't meaningless or accidental like Grant's. It was a nod to both his grandfathers, Anderson Ship Truman and Solomon Young. Because it didn't stand for a particular name, Truman often omitted the period, but... Yeah, it was really, I think, if I understand right, it was like they didn't want to decide on one or the other, so they just made it S. And it's interesting because, I'm trying to remember, there was a, a, a TV movie made about Truman, which is very good, by the way. Gary Sinise plays Harry Truman. And when he is sworn in at one point, he actually says, I, Harry Ship Truman. Uh, referring to Ship, which was the um, grandfather's last name. There are plenty of examples where he included the period, so feel free to do whatever you want with this one. I promise he will not care. And there are actually a lot of presidents whose names are a little different than we expect. Um, a lot of presidents who went by their middle names, for example. So John Calvin Coolidge, uh, Thomas Woodrow Wilson are just a couple of examples. Dwight D. Eisenhower was the only Ike in his family. If you're hurting your brain trying to figure out how Ike is short for Dwight, it just don't. It's meant to be short for Eisenhower. Yeah. And Dwight's older brother, Edgar, went by it too. Edgar was Big Ike, and Dwight was Little Ike. <laughs> the JFK assassination was the only attempt on his life. In December 1960, a retired postal worker filled his car with dynamite, intending to ram into JFK's car and blow them both up in the process. The Secret Service uncovered the plot, and the man was arrested hmm. before he could I don't think it. I've ever heard that. According to former agent Abraham Bolden, the Secret Service found evidence of another potential assassination planned for Kennedy's trip to Chicago in early November 1963. He canceled his visit out of caution, but followed through with his ill-fated appearance in Dallas just hmm. weeks later. Lyndon Johnson was called Landslide Lyndon because he won by a landslide. In the 1964 presidential election, Lyndon Johnson beat Republican Barry Goldwater by a landslide. He won 61.1% of the popular vote, the highest popular vote percentage achieved by a president in the modern era. But that's not how LBJ earned the nickname Landslide Lyndon. That was coined after Johnson won the Democratic nomination for a Senate seat in 1948 by just 87 votes out of more than 988,000. People were just being sarcastic. <laughs> Richard Nixon was impeached. No. The Watergate scandal did result in Richard Nixon's removal from office, but it wasn't because he got impeached. In July 1974, the House Judiciary Committee delivered three articles of impeachment to the House of Representatives accusing Nixon of high crimes and misdemeanors. If the House approved the articles by majority vote, Nixon would have gone down in the history books as an impeached president. After House approval, the Senate would have held a trial and decided whether he was guilty. If convicted by two-thirds vote, Nixon would have then gone down as the only president to have been impeached and convicted. But 
None of that happened. Nixon chose to resign before the House got a chance to vote, making him the only U.S. president yep. to have quit the job. Gerald Ford was related to Henry Ford. Nah, it wasn't even Gerald a Ford. Ford's birth name wasn't even Gerald Ford. It was Leslie Lynch yep. King Jr. after his father, Leslie Lynch King. And that's actually um, one of two presidents whose whole name changed, at least last name changed. Uh, the other one was William Je Jefferson Blythe. I think William Jef Jefferson Blythe III, I think, is uh, Bill, Bill Clinton's birth name. His parents separated just a couple weeks after his birth in 1913, and his mother married Gerald R. Ford a few years later. Soon after that, they unofficially switched little Leslie's name to Gerald R. Ford Jr. So even if Ford's adoptive father had been biologically related to the automobile magnate, which does not seem to be the case, the future president still wouldn't have been. Yep. Jimmy Carter founded Habitat for Humanity. No, but dude is heavily involved in it. I've never heard anybody say he founded it, but uh, man, l let me tell you what. Um, obviously, Jimmy Carter's presidency is not very highly regarded, his one term in office, but has there ever been anybody who had a more successful post-presidency? Jimmy Carter is one of my favorite human beings who has ever lived. He is just a phenomenal guy. Um, the stuff he does, uh, even for a former president, man, just good for him. Jimmy and Rosalind Carter started working with Habitat for Humanity back in 1984 and just never stopped. Every year since then, excluding 2020 and 2021 due to the pandemic, they've held a Carter Work Project where they spend a week building houses. So far, the tradition has resulted in the construction or repair of more than 4,300 houses awesome. across 14 countries. The Carter's high profile has helped increase awareness of Habitat for Humanity more generally. It's also given rise to the notion that they founded the organization, which they did not. It was founded in the 1970s by Millard and Linda Fuller. Ronald Reagan was supposed to star as Rick Blaine. I never heard that one either. To be fair, this rumor was started by Warner Brothers itself. In January 1942, the studio put out a press release claiming this, Anne Sheridan and Ronald Reagan co-star for the third time in Warner's Casablanca, with Dennis Morgan also coming in for top huh. billing. According to Snopes, it wasn't uncommon for studios to make erroneous announcements like this as a way to keep their contracted actors in the headlines. Warner Interesting. Brothers had a good reason for planting this one. Sheridan and Reagan's film King's Row was slated for release just weeks later. When the press release was published, Casablanca didn't even have a screenplay yet, and no casting decisions had been made. George H.W. Bush banned broccoli from Air Force One. <laughs> Not true, but fantastic story. He, he very famously hated broccoli. I do too. Don't blame him a bit. And he also had this issue where at one point he like threw up on the Japanese prime minister or something. I don't remember exactly what it was. As George H.W. Bush famously declared in 1990, I do not like broccoli and I haven't liked it since I was a little kid and my mother made me eat it and I'm president of the United States and I'm not going to eat any more Good broccoli. Good for him. Very similar to the speech I made to my mother on my seventh birthday. In 2013, data journalist Eric Ostermeyer crunched the numbers and reported that Bush mentioned the cruciferous veggie about 70 times during his presidency. Wow. He absolutely hated it. And the media loved that he hated it. But contrary to popular belief, he didn't literally ban broccoli from the White House or Air Force One. He just didn't want it served to him. Bush clarified that his wife Barbara was a big fan of broccoli and, quote, eats it all the time herself. While speaking to the press at a state dinner, Bush said, I have not ordered broccoli off Air Force One. I have just said, don't you dare bring me another spoon <laughs> of that vegetable. Bill Clinton attended WrestleMania 10. Who do you think I, I gotta say, listen, maybe I'm just out of touch or something. I haven't heard of most of these, uh, so I mean, it doesn't mean they're popular misconceptions. I guess they can still be misconceptions. They're just not widespread enough that I've heard them. Have you guys heard of these? I mean, tell me, uh, these ones that I've said, like, I've never heard that before. If they're ones you've heard at some point, let me know in the comment section. I think it seems a little weird for a sitting president to attend WrestleMania. You are correct. The WWF made it seem like the real Bill Clinton was in attendance at 1994's WrestleMania 10 at Madison Square Garden, but in reality, it was Clinton impersonator Tim Waters. I will say this though, Bill Clinton very famously, while he was running for president, and listen, when Clinton first started running, he was kind of the underdog. He, he was not like a favorite to get the Democratic nomination, and then he was definitely not a favorite to win the White House, and you know, things just kind of fell into place for him. And, 
And one of the things that happened was that he did this very famous appearance on the Arsenio Hall show, which was a famous uh, late night talk show at the time. And he played the uh, saxophone and he came across as this young, cool, hip guy. He was a new generation, you know, because uh, Bill Clinton was born in the 40s. He's a baby boomer. So he's a whole generation after the current president at the time, George H.W. Bush. And he was by far the latest born president that we'd had in a long time. In fact, uh, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Donald Trump were all born within a couple of a month, months of each other in the same year, 1946. Waters would later portray the president in a 1998 episode of The Nanny, among other programs. It's kind of his thing. George W. Bush's head was intentionally featured in Game of Thrones. I have heard in 2012, that. Game of Thrones I've seen that. David Benioff and D.B. Wise mentioned in the DVD commentary for season one's 10th episode that one of the prosthetic decapitated heads was George W. Bush. George Bush's head appears in a couple of beheading scenes. It's not a choice, it's not a political statement. We just had to use whatever head we had around. This caused quite a bit of backlash, and Wise and Benioff released an apology explaining, we can't afford to have the prosthetic body parts all made from scratch, yeah. especially in scenes where we need a lot of them, so we rent them in bulk. After the scene was already shot, someone pointed out that one of the heads looked like George W. Bush. HBO then digitally altered the head to make it less recognizable, <laughs> so Bush is no longer part of the Game of Thrones universe. Ed Sheeran still is. <laughs> Listen, I didn't mind the Ed Sheeran appearance. There were a lot of other things that you could complain about, about Game of Thrones, before you can complain about Ed Sheeran. I, I didn't think it was a bad appearance. I thought the song he sang was cool. I liked the scene where you have Arya... Uh, sitting down with all of these Lannister soldiers and it kind of helps her to see that not everybody on the Lannister side was evil, that these were just ordinary soldiers who were, you know, just wanting to get home to their families. Uh, I didn't mind the scene at all. Barack Obama chartered a private jet for his dog. Never heard that While one. covering the Obama's visit to Acadia National Park in July 2010, Waterville, Maine's Morning Sentinel included this line in an article. Arriving in a small jet before the Obamas was the first dog, Bo, a Portuguese water dog given as a present by the late U.S. Senator Ted Kennedy and the president's personal aide, Reggie Love, who chatted with Governor John Baldacci. That made it seem like the Obamas had chartered a private jet for just their dog and his handler. The newspaper almost immediately issued a clarification that, quote, there were other occupants on the plane, <laughs> including several other staffers. It also explained that two smaller jets had been used because the airport couldn't accommodate the president's regular larger jet. Yeah, and actually the president, you know, a lot of people don't realize this, but he doesn't always take Air Force One when he flies. Uh, you know, for example, here, uh, the local airport for us is the Youngstown Warren Airport. It's a smaller airport with a smaller runway. Can't land a 747 there. So he's actually got like a smaller version of airport, Air Force One. It's got the same paint scheme and everything. And Air Force One is whatever plane the president's on. So if he's on a private jet, if he's on a big 747, that is Air Force One at that time. Um, yeah, so, uh, and by the way, Acadia National Park uh, up there in Maine is gorgeous. And I highly recommend if you ever get the chance to go. Bo was a pampered pooch for sure, just not that pampered. Donald J. Trump is the only U.S. president to have gotten no, divorced. Reagan. There's actually one other, Ronald Reagan, yep. who was married to actress Jane Wyman from 1940 to 1949. Joe Biden first ran for president in 2008. Joe Biden's Earlier. presidential campaign in 2020 wasn't his first rodeo, and neither was his failed bid to become the Democratic nominee in 2008. He also tossed this hat in the ring in 1987 for the election coming up in 1988. It did not go very well. He lifted parts of several fellow politicians' yep. speeches without citing them and exaggerated his law school achievements at a campaign stop. The future president admitted fault and took responsibility for all the missteps. And listen, uh, without getting into any modern politics or anything like that, regardless of how you feel about Joe Biden, fascinating story, especially when he first got elected to the Senate. He was like just barely old enough. He was in his mid-30s uh, when he got elected to the Senate. Uh, it may, may have been younger. Now i got to look it up. Yeah, so he was actually 30. Uh, that's what it is. 30 is how old you have to be to be uh, in the Senate. So he's one of the youngest senators in history. And he had just had this horrible tragedy uh, right off the bat. Uh, early in life where his wife and one of his kids were killed in a car accident. Very sad. And a lot to overcome, and I give him a lot of credit for overcoming that. But ultimately decided to drop out of the race about three months after entering it. 
There you have it, 46 misconceptions about the 45 presidents of the United States of America. I tried to fit an extra one in about my president, Josiah Bartlett, but my producer... Yeah. Josiah Bartlett. So, uh, Josiah Bartlett is Martin Sheen's uh, character in The West Wing, and I think no matter what your political persuasion is, I think he's probably a favorite of most people. Uh, and if a guy like that really existed, he'd have my vote for sure. And I think a lot of other people would agree with that. So hope you guys enjoyed that. Like I said, let me know in the comment section if there are ones of these that I was like, I've never heard that, but you have heard it. I'm just curious to know how widespread those are. And if you didn't see episode one, check it out. And we'll be back tomorrow with some more. Uh, just to give you a heads up, there is a link in the description to my podcast if you want to check that out. I actually just finished recording uh, episode two of my look at the tragic lives of American presidents, where we take a look at the stories of uh, James Madison, James Monroe, and John Quincy Adam and Adams and their families. There was a lot of tragedy in most of our American presidents. So uh, discussing that in my latest podcast should be live in the next day or two. Thanks for watching.